Good evening again, or for the first time, however it may be. This has become uh, one of my favorite evenings of the month to preach and teach, as it's Stump the Preacher, and this is number seven that we've done so far. And uh, I know uh, it's a holiday evening, and some may need to get out and get some candy, but if you bear with me, uh, we'll get through this uh, probably fairly quickly tonight. Good questions tonight. We, uh, for those that uh, are unaware, we do have the last Sunday of the month, uh, evening, the Stump the Preacher session, where questions will be submitted about uh, various different things. Uh, the questions can, well, I need to go see the optometrist. They can be silly or serious, uh, but they do have to make sense, and I've always been free to answer them just about every, any way I want with a firm biblical passage. Uh, common sense, a reasonable speculation to some degree. Uh, we, I need them in advance. Uh, you, you could give them to me tonight and I could try, but uh, I want to just make sure I have all the right verses down. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to say, well, I don't know the answer, so I go look it up and then, oh, I have the answer. Um, I, I look at the question and then say, yeah, I think I'm pretty sure how this will go, and I want to make sure I, I get all the right verses and everything listed and put in right order, so it gives me a little bit of time to do that, and also, uh, we don't ask questions to uh, make a point to somebody else um, that we're trying to embarrass or uh, anything of that nature, so uh, with that in mind, uh, you have uh, the handout, if you haven't picked one of those up, uh, you can pick one up on the way out, uh, the handout uh, of the questions that we're going to go through this evening. And hopefully we will gain some good understanding from them together. The first question is a very good question. Was Vashti a Jew? And this goes back to the book of Esther uh, in the Old Testament. If you want to turn over to Esther chapter 1, we're introduced to this character, uh, Vashti, who is the queen. Uh, Artaxerxes, or Asherus, is the uh, king at this time. And we find her in chapter 1 being a person who loses her position because of her refusal to uh, meet the king's request. He had thrown a drunken party, and after many days of drinking with his friends, uh, the golden vessels, uh, and drinking together, they became extremely drunk and called for her to come and perform for them, to dance before them. Now the text, as we read it, uh, says, if you begin in verse 11, to bring Queen Vashti before the king, wearing her royal crown in order to show her beauty to the people and the officials, for she was beautiful to behold, but she refused to come at the king's command. And, uh, of course, his friends said, well, you can't let her get, by, get away with that. If she does it, then guess what? When I tell my wife to come, my wife won't come. And so he says, you've got to make an example of her. And he does. He takes the throne away from her. Now, it's been speculated that the way that it's described there, that she was called to come and just wearing her royal crown. I'm not sure if she, that's all they wanted her to wear, uh, but it may be the case. And so they may have expected her to put on a show to be an exhibition uh, before his friends, and she refused to do that. Uh, her name uh, from Esther 1 is, she's probably a Persian. Uh, her name means beautiful, a beautiful woman. And of course, this is what the king wanted his guests to see. There's no known reference to her uh, outside of Esther. Uh, she is referred to the, as the queen until she is dethroned. And so she's probably not a Jew at this time, but she is a Persian uh, queen. Now we know after uh, she is removed from the position of queen that a search is made for a new queen and I would argue by the providence of God, Esther is chosen to take that spot. She does serve as a good example, though. And I want to say this just as a side point. She serves as a very good example, especially to younger women, about the dignity and respect that you deserve. Uh, even though she may not have been a Jew and living under the Jewish customs of the time where um, this would have been frowned upon, she did have dignity. And she did have to stand for her principles, and she was willing to do that no matter what the cost. So many times we hear people say the Bible is pro-male or anti-woman. Uh, I mean, God is referred to in the masculine pronouns, and Jesus was a, a man, and the, the disciples were men. And we read about the emphasis that placed on the male heir so many times. But I also argue that the Bible makes great strides in trying to promote the dignity and respect for women that this world still doesn't have in many places. 
And so to look at her as an example of one who stood for her principles, refused to be used as an example on this occasion is a wonderful story and study in and of itself. So uh, to answer the question, was she a Jew? Probably not. She's probably a Persian. Okay, question number two. And we may have touched on this at one point, but it has come again. If there were no people on earth, how did Cain get married? Well, we go back to Genesis chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. And we read of Cain and Abel and Adam and Eve. But the Bible tells us after the death of Abel caused by Cain, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, dwelt in the land of Nod at the east of Eden. Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bore Enoch. And he built a city and called on the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. So it is the case that you have um, Cain leaving uh, this area, but it's reasonable to assume that Adam and Eve continued to have children after Cain, Abel, and Seth. I, I think about uh, the situation uh, with Christine and I, Ben and Jenny are 13 months apart. And so if you could have a child every 13 to 15 months, uh, on, you know, if that's the regular interval that you wanted to have a child, and you live to be 900 and some years old, it may very well be the case they had more children. So who did Cain marry on the, this occasion? Uh, they would have been descendants of the first couple. They would have been descendants of Adam and Eve. They would have been somehow related to Cain, but aren't we all? Uh, we all get back to that original pair. Uh, they, they, these would have been people that uh, uh, were born to, to Adam and Eve and then born to their children and born to their children and could have been great nieces, great nephews, you know, Marion and things of this nature. And so uh, where did Cain get his wife? Um, it's reasonable to assume there was quite a population on the earth by the time the fall comes. Uh, when you read through Genesis 4, it appears that there's only four people on the earth, but uh, surely, uh, by reasonable assumption, Adam and Eve didn't wait until the boys were old enough to commit this act for them to start having children again. Uh, they had another child, Seth, but uh, after, after the death of, of Abel. But it's reasonable to assume they had several children in the, the interval time as well. All right, question number three. It's a very good question. It's a tough question to, to ask and to answer at some point in our lives because we've all dealt with individuals and situations that promote this. God made me this way. Did God make people to be born gay? There's a couple of things that I've got a whole list of. Am I still writing them down, right? I've got a whole list of verses here to go through, and so this might be a little bit of a lengthy answer, but I think it's a good answer. I know what the Bible has to say about the creation. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, where the Bible says, God uh, uh, said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, uh, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God he created them. Male and female, he created them. And so I read from the very beginning that God created them male and female. There's only two genders. If that is a question in your mind tonight, or anybody might have, how many genders are there? There's two. God made them male and female. Now, while we read about homosexuality, we want to read in the New Testament, in Romans chapter 1, verse 24 through 27, we read it as a sin that is listed here. God gave them over to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and, and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one for another, men with men, committing what is shameful, receiving in themselves the penalty of the error which was due." And so I read in Romans chapter 1 that what is happening here is it's, it's something that uh, is against the natural use. I like how the Holy Spirit uses that word, the natural use of the body uh, that this homosexual sin is being committed. And so uh, when we read about this, we start to ask this, this question then, why do people make this assertion? Uh, why do they say this? And, and it, it's, it, the logic doesn't seem to be there. I read in 1 Timothy chapter 2, but he wants all men to repent. And so to ask the original, answer the original question, would God make somebody or create somebody with a sinful nature in order to condemn them? And, well, no, he wouldn't do that. And so it must be a choice that is made. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 and verse 10, there were some who were at the church at Corinth who uh, in former times committed these acts. But 
They were washed, they were sanctified, they were justified by the blood of Christ. And so when they became Christians, they, those sins that uh, they had committed were washed uh, away. And so I would, down through the first four uh, points here, we would argue, no, uh, it wouldn't be the case that God would make someone this way any more than he would make them a thief or a liar or an adulterer uh, or any other uh, sin that we read about in the Bible because why would God make that person in such a way and then condemn them because of who they are? It's a choice that people make. It's a behavior that people choose. Uh, And so... Uh, We see that from those passages. Now, here's the real issue that may come up from time to time. Why then do some men have a temptation uh, to lust after other men and women to lust after other women? I know a couple of things for sure. James chapter 1, verse 13 and verse 14. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone, but each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Uh, I know that God does not send the temptation uh, any more than he would send the temptation for any other uh, act that is against his will. Uh, Temptation doesn't come from God. So why would somebody be tempted to be attracted or have that desire to be attracted to someone of the same sex? I can't explain that. I can't explain why some people are tempted that way any more than I can explain why some people are tempted to steal. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know why. Uh, you know, for me, there's no temptation uh, to um, drink alcohol. I can't stand the smell of it. Uh, certainly couldn't stand the taste of it. And yes, I have tasted it years ago. Don't recommend it. Uh, it, it it's not something I'm tempted today to do. Now, why don't I have that temptation? I don't know. There are other temptations that I might have uh, that uh, I'm not going into tonight because nobody asked the question. And so, uh, and uh, you better not ask it for November either. Um, (laughs) But why are some people tempted about some things and and others are not? I don't don't know. I don't know why some people feel the desire or uh, attraction to the same sex any more than anybody else would feel a desire to do anything else. But what I do know is this. If we stop looking at homosexuality and calling it an orientation, or we stop looking at it and calling it a lifestyle, if we start calling it a temptation, we look at it differently and we deal with it differently. Uh, If I tell you I'm tempted in a lot of different ways, uh, different aspects of my life, I have a lot of different temptations, you may be more empathetic towards me. You may feel more concerned towards me. But if there's someone who is uh, having problems with homosexuality and they're tempted uh, for one reason or another, again, I can't explain why. Uh, If they're attracted to the same sex and they're tempted uh, toward that, and we look at it differently as something that's shameful and something that's, that should be uh, an outcast. Uh, that's not the way to deal with it. That's not the way to look at it. If we would understand the struggle a little bit better as a temptation and not necessarily uh, just a lifestyle that someone chooses, then we could uh, be more encouraging and helpful to get through those times of temptation. And so uh, to answer the initial question, um, no, God wouldn't create somebody with that, but why are they tempted? Uh, I don't know. Uh, We know temptation doesn't come from God. Temptation comes from Satan, and so if there is some inclination a person has towards that, he's going to, he's going to try to exploit that. But we need to, we need to be there to help and empathize with them during that struggle. Okay, question number five, four. Good thing I wrote that one down. Marriage ceremonies vary greatly across times and cultures. Is there a difference between marriage recognized by God and marriage recognized by the state? And if so, what makes them different? Well, a couple of verses uh, to go along with this. If you start in Genesis chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, you've got the first marriage that takes place. The rib which God had taken from man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And said, uh, Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and the wife, and they were not ashamed. Now, this first wedding ceremony is a little bit different than what we see today. Uh, having married off one child who was, happens to be a, a male, I found it was somewhat cheaper than it's going to be with the female. And so I'm, I'm almost... 
want to point to Hannah and say, you know, Hannah, we might want to go back to the way God did it. Here, Cody, take your wife and just shove her out the door. Uh, <laughs> say, oh, you're married. But uh, as far as ceremonies go, uh, those are based upon our culture and our likes and our dislikes. There is no set ceremony in the scriptures that we are to follow. So many times we find the case where a woman is brought to the man and he takes her into the tent and they uh, consummate the marriage and they're married and that's how the rest of it goes. But we live in a society that is a little bit different from that. Um, in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus lays out the blueprint, first of all, what marriage should be. And he explains this is what God has done. And so any marriage that is to take place, it is, of course, a, an institution that God started. And any institution that God starts, God needs to have that intrinsic value in it. Uh, for us as Christians, uh, God-approved marriages are important. This is the reason we get married with, you know, all the, the ideas of, uh, of, of, of almost a sermon during the, the marriage ceremony, except, you know, changing of, exchanging of vows and the giving of rings and the lighting of a unity candle. But somewhere we talk about the importance of marriage as far as the Bible is concerned because we want, it, uh, want God to uh, be a part of that. We know Hebrews 13 and verse 4 that the marriage is, uh, marriage is honorable among all. And so we see it as a blessing uh, not only to our families, but a blessing to God. Now, a, what we would call perhaps maybe a state-recognized marriage has all the legal paperwork. Uh, you know, I would like to say to Hannah, you know, take her to Cody's house and shove her through the door and say, hey, she's yours now, but uh, eventually she's going to have to fill out some paperwork, isn't she? She's going to have to fill out the marriage certificate license. They're going to have to have that. They're going to have to have a uh, change of uh, her last name, uh, Social Security. All those things, all the rights and privileges that come with uh, being a married couple according to our state. Uh, I've only seen one, and that just uh, happened to be because we were there at the time. I've only seen one couple married in front of a judge. Uh, I was down here at the courthouse fighting a ticket one day. Uh, I won, by the way. Uh, I, fought, I fought the law, and I won. And uh, I was, we were waiting for my, my time to fight that ticket, and there was a couple in there that had their marriage certificate. And uh, after the judge had finished with, with uh, one case, uh, he pointed to them and said, are you here to get married? And they said, yes. And so, well, he looked at us and said, do you mind waiting? <laughs> what am I going to say? You know, uh, I'm trying to stay on the good side of the judge here. So sure, go ahead. And so he called him up and uh, read a few things and, and asked him a couple questions and signed it and said, congratulations, you're married. And so we may look at that sometimes as a, uh, and it was beautiful, by the way. Uh, it was a beautiful thing to witness. Uh, but we may recognize that as a state-recognized marriage. Even if the couple has no desire, though, to make God a part of their marriage, even if the couple has no desire to have God be a part of their lives, uh, whenever they enter into this act of holy matrimony, it still needs to meet God's standards. And that is uh, because he, or he, he, he's the originator of marriage. And so uh, is there a difference between a marriage recognized God and a marriage recognized by the state? Perhaps. Perhaps. The state may recognize it just as from a legal standpoint, but um, all marriages need to be recognized by God because he is the originator of it. Felt like a, felt like a witness to that marriage. It was kind of sweet and uh, sweet and beautiful. All right. Question number five. Can a Christian participate in Halloween? Ooh, it's Halloween. Um, what about other holidays? I'm going to, uh, I, got, I got a confession to make to you. This question is my question. No one gave me this question. I wanted to answer this question because I wanted to ask myself uh, this question. And you know I stumped myself, so let's go to question number nine. Uh, no, um, <laughs> I'm the only one that can stump myself, right? No, I, this, was a, this is something I've been thinking about. And... Um, since this is recognized on the calendar as Halloween, uh, can a Christian participate in it? And what about other holidays? In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, in that entire chapter, we have Paul dealing with the subject of the conscience and how it's important for us to be sensitive to the conscience of others. And in this, he's talking about meat that's been offered to idols. Uh, as we mentioned this morning, idols aren't real. Idols can't hear, taste, touch, smell, help, can't do anything. Idols aren't real. But there are people who would offer their meat as a sacrifice to the idol. Now, obviously, once you go through the ceremony of offering that meat, you've got a bunch of meat sitting there. And so what do you do with it? 
Well, I might call over some of my friends who happen to be followers of Christ and have a barbecue. And so Paul says it may be the case that if you find out it was offered to an idol and that offends your conscience, don't eat it. But he says there's really nothing wrong with it. Uh, it, it doesn't make any difference to him. Uh, it was just, it's just meat, and he's just there to eat that, uh, that, that food. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verse 10, uh, 20 and 21, uh, rather the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. I don't want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of the demons, but you cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. So there, there is a definite um, picture here that if we treat this day or this holiday or any other holiday in a religious significance, what are we doing? Well, if we treat it as a religious significance of the day to worship Satan, we're eating and drinking with demons, and Paul said not to do that. And so uh, we find that to be the case uh, here. Now, so um, I'll come back around to Halloween here in a minute. Uh, I'll answer the other part of that. What about other holidays? What about national holidays, Fourth of July, uh, Valentine's Day, uh, other national holidays, uh, maybe even Christmas? Um, we could lump in that. A couple of things here that are kind of interesting. In Esther chapter 9 and verse 22, after the salvation of uh, the Jews by the work of Esther, and uh, you remember Haman, uh, wicked Haman, had attempted to slaughter the Jews, but because of her efforts, they were spared. And verse 22, the days on which the Jews had rest from their enemies, as a month which was turned from sorrow to joy for them and from mourning to a holiday, that they should make them uh, days of feasting and joy and sending presents to one another and gifts to the poor. You read in John chapter 5 and verse 1, and, and what have I got it written up there? Oh, uh, chapter 5, verse, I couldn't understand where the 10 came from. Uh, chapter 5 and verse 1, and then again in chapter 10, uh, there was a feast of the Jews. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In verse 10, the Jews therefore said to him, who was cured? It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. The only feast that took place on the Sabbath in that period, three-year period of time was Purim. And this was a feast of holiday that began with Esther in Esther chapter 9, verse 22. It wasn't a holiday found in the law of Moses. It was a time where the Jews, celebrating their uh, deliverance, decided we're going to have a holiday. And guess what? Jesus celebrated that holiday. In John chapter 10 and verse 22, we read about Jesus again, the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. Now, we, make, we have a different name for this. In my uh, young adult college-age class, uh, zip it on this. I don't want you to give the answer away, but what feast of the Jews is celebrated in winter? Hanukkah. Yeah, Hanukkah. Uh, here it's called the Feast of Dedication, and it's in the winter. And where's Jesus? He's going up to celebrate Hanukkah. Hanukkah was the occasion where, uh, in between the Testaments, where the Jews had stood up against Antiochus, and of course you know the story about how they had enough oil for their lamp for one night, but it lasted for eight nights. Um, I, again, I told the class this morning, I don't think there was anything miraculous about it. Have you ever had toothpaste that you thought was almost gone, but you just kept getting a little bit more out every time? Uh, I think they had a little bit more oil than they realized they had. But they looked at it as a great celebration, and God was with them. And, and so they celebrated that. Uh, Jesus celebrated a national holiday, uh, two of them, in fact, Purim and Hanukkah. And so I would argue this. If my Lord was okay with celebrating a holiday based upon national interests, and I, to me, that's how I view Halloween and Christmas and Easter. I don't find any religious significance in any of them. Uh, then... It's just a national holiday. Uh, if my Lord would celebrate with the ones that he was a part, he knew about, uh, it should be okay for me to celebrate as well. Uh, if we do have a bit of an uh, issue sometimes, uh, we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. If you're sensitive to the subject and it bothers your conscience, I understand, and I'm not going to push it uh, any further than that. Uh, I don't want you to violate your conscience in any way. But I will just by way of maybe being consistent in how we do things. Uh, if, if, I, if you give your wife flowers on Valentine's Day, do you realize that's a Roman um, tradition and holiday regarding St. Valentine? Uh, when we place flowers on the graves of our loved ones, um, the Hindus do that. And so are we practicing Hinduism when we do that? 
Uh, does the wedding ceremony in, church, in a church building uh, imply that we endorse the Catholic notion that it is something that has to be done in a building? Well, of course not. Uh, when Jenny and Hannah went to a Halloween party many years ago, dressed as Tinkerbell and Cinderella, still one of my favorite pictures. They were scared to death. They didn't know very many kids there, and they're holding hands, because when you have a sister, you always have a friend. Uh, when we sent them to that party, were we engaging in a worship of the devil? I don't think we were. And so uh, just to be consistent about the way we do things, we need to keep that in mind. So that's my answer to that question. Question number six, why were people so calm in the Bible when animals talked to them? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. That's a good question. Uh, a couple of, there, by the way, there's only two instances where this happens in all of history that we know about where an animal talked to a human. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 through 5, the serpent speaks to Eve. Now, we know this is Satan, and he's tempting her. But in Numbers 22, 22 through 32, uh, Balaam is riding his donkey, and the donkey keeps giving him problems, and it finally pushes him up against a tight spot, and he keeps smacking the donkey. And uh, finally, you know, he, he stops, and he speaks. And he said, why, why do you keep hitting me? Well, why, why won't you do what I tell you to do? I don't think we would have the same reaction. Um, if you go home, if you go home tonight, and uh, we open the door. We got Daisy back, by the way. We brought her home with us last week, but uh, our little Yorkie. And if we go home and open the door, she comes running up, said, "Dad, Dad!" I'm, Whoa, I'm not going through the door it, it, because we don't expect animals to talk to us. Now, I could argue the first one pretty easy. How many animals spoke to people up to this point? Uh, Eve may not have known any better. She may not have realized that animals aren't supposed to talk, uh, but this one is. And so she uh, engages in a conversation with it. Balaam uh, may be a little bit different uh, on this occasion. Uh, he was angry. And sometimes being angry can overshadow the obvious, that he needs to be a little bit more surprised at what's happening, but he's angry. And if you've ever been so angry in your life that you don't really recognize the obvious that's going on, uh, I think that's the case here, um, why he seems to, seems to be so calm about it. This isn't a common occurrence. It's the only two instances in the Bible, but so why did they remain so calm? Uh, Eve didn't know any better, and Balaam was mad. And so uh, I, I guess that's the best I can, I can do with that. If an animal talked to us today, I think we would have a, certainly have a different reaction uh, to it. At least you should, I guess. I, I don't know. Snake starts talking to you. If you want to talk back, talk back. I don't... I don't know what to tell you. All right, uh, question number seven, and then we'll start to wrap this up tonight. If a denomination follows the Bible and baptism and the Lord's Supper, but they have instrumental music to accompany the singing, are they sinning since the use of instruments are not specifically condemned in Scripture? Well, there's a couple of arguments to make here before we get into these verses. I want to give you something that's called the constituent argument. And we don't hear much about this argument, but it's a very good argument in regards to worship or salvation, anything where there's more than one part to it. With salvation, you've got, uh, you know, you've got to hear and believe, repent, confess, be baptized, live faithful. With worship, we've got um, uh, singing, praying, Lord's Supper, giving, and teaching. And so there's parts that make up the whole. If one of the parts isn't right, uh, the whole's not right. Uh, so if you look at it, maybe like in making a, a pie, if you have all the ingredients to make a good pie, but you leave out the most important ingredient, which I did on one occasion, uh, we're having, uh, don't ask me to make a pumpkin pie because I made two pumpkin pies once and left the sugar out of them. And uh, I even tasted the batter before we cooked it. I said, boy, this tastes strange, but we cooked it. And I said, I better take a piece of this and try it. And it tasted like cardboard. I put all the other ingredients in, but I had not put the sugar in. And so was the pie correct? Well, no, the pie wasn't correct. All the other ingredients were right, but one ingredient was wrong. And so uh, that's the constituent argument. If in regards to salvation, I hear and believe and repent and confess, but I'm not baptized, am I saved? If I hear and believe and confess and are baptized, but I never repent of my sins, am I saved? You've got to have all the parts correct for the whole to be correct. The same is true with worship. You've got to have all the parts correct. Everything that we do and all the acts of worship that we do and the things regarding the Lord's Supper, and if all individual parts are correct that make up this entire piece, this entire pie, then, all, uh, then it's correct. 
And so Jesus said in John chapter 4 and verse 24, of course, that we've got to worship God in spirit and in truth according to the commands of the New Testament, according to the right attitude found uh, that we're supposed to have. As far as the singing is concerned, uh, maybe I'll do a lesson sometime on this subject and go in a little bit more detail about the use of instruments and singing in our worship service. But Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19 that we speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, uh, the question, part of the question was, uh, there's no um, specific command not to use instruments. Uh, It's not specifically condemned in scriptures. Therefore, are they sinning? Well, there's something called the silence argument, and it's in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 14, where it talks about uh, Judah. And, And the writer says, For it's evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. So when uh, it came to the priesthood, uh, there was one tribe, it was the Levites, right? But when it came to the other tribes, the Lord didn't, you know, Moses didn't say, okay, Judah, you're the kings, you're not the priests. Uh, you know, he didn't go down through there and list it. When he said Judah or Levi is the priest, it, it, it eliminated everybody else. And so when the Lord says in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, among other passages in the New Testament that we sing, making melody in our hearts and our Lord, to the Lord, it eliminates all other methods of music, uh, instrumental or vocal. Well, vocal is what we do, uh, but it would eliminate vocal. And so uh, based upon that, there is an argument from the scriptures uh, against the use of instrumental music because God said this is how you do it. He didn't. Uh, you remember... Um, all the if if everything Jesus did, the world can contain the books that will they'll be written uh, because there's so much information, so many other things. Uh, could you imagine if uh, take for example Lord's Supper? This is my body. This is my blood. It's the unleavened bread. It's the vine. And Jesus went through and said, "Okay, here's what you don't use. You don't use." Uh, olive juice, you don't use grape, or well, no, we do use grape juice. You don't use uh, tomato juice. You don't use plain water. You don't, if he had started listing every si- single liquid to exclude them so that we understand it's that fruit of the vine, uh, it would have been a lengthy list. When he said fruit of the vine, that's what he meant. When he said bread, uh, unleavened bread, that's what he meant. When he says sing, that's what he means. And so if I'm worshiping God um, you know, by partaking the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week as directed in the New Testament, and I baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit for the remission of their sins, and uh, we give out of a cheerful heart, but there's one part of the pie that's not right. The whole's not right, and so um, we need to keep that in mind. Okay, I've already got one question for next month, and you can ask them then. I had thought about doing this uh, live. Uh, you can just bring your questions that night. And then I, I thought I'd better of myself uh, because you've got good questions. And some of them take a little bit of time to get the scriptures and make sure we have it right. But the next, uh, next occasion will be November 28th after the evening, uh, for the evening service. There won't be one in December. So if you have a question, don't think, well, I'll wait till December, uh, mainly because um, I want to take a month off. And so uh, give, me, give me something else to talk about. But I do appreciate your, your questions, and I hope that these have been beneficial to you. If you have any other uh, comments or questions, any follow-ups that you'd like to ask after service, by all means ask. And we'll be happy to, I'll be happy to talk to you about it. Well, we've come to that point of our service then where we uh, want to offer the invitation of our Lord, which is available at all times, but because of the convenience of the time that we're together. And we're going to sing a song of encouragement. If you are ready to put on Christ in baptism, let's, let's take care of that tonight. Uh, we don't want to go another minute outside of Christ. And so uh, if you're ready to put that, make that decision in your life, want to become a child of God, that's a good decision to make. We'll assist you with that. Or as a child of God, if you have struggles where we can go to God in prayer for you, let's pray for one another. Let's encourage one another. As we go through this Christian walk, we can do that as well. If you need to respond to the invitation, why don't you come as we stand and sing the song of encouragement.